Welcome to Knowledgeable Aging. I'm your host, Jason Kotar. Joining us today to talk about hospice and palliative care is Lorraine Spiota. Lorraine is a community liaison for Hospice of New Jersey, building relationships within the community and simplifying the extensive coverage of hospice services to patients and families. She is the president and founder of Senior Long-Term Care Insurance Brokerage. Lorraine has been widely recognized and acknowledged in New Jersey as one of the foremost spokespersons in the long-term care insurance industry. In addition, Lorraine is the author of Key Solutions for Caregivers, a simplistic and realistic guide for caregivers. How are you doing today, Lorraine? Good. Thank you, Jason. How are you? Doing very good. good thank you for you. joining us. Uh, second time together. I'm looking forward to it. But before we get started, uh, for those that are joining us for the live webinar, you might see a control pin on your right hand side. So if you have any questions, we encourage you to type those questions in at any time. Time permitting, we will do everything in our power to get your questions answered. So Lorraine, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining. My name is Lorraine Spiata. And um, I, too, am going through um, a family member who is uh, end stage of life with a disease of Parkinson's. And uh, falls happen and change of care plan happens on a daily basis. So I look forward to hopefully sharing some knowledge and information about what the difference of palliative care and hospice. So palliative is kind of like a new, a new word. Uh, that everyone is hearing so much about because the hospitals have created teams of people who help people who are still seeking aggressive treatment. So you'll see here on the screen, what is palliative care? So treatment that enhances comfort and improves the quality of an individual's life who is facing a serious illness, but may not qualify for hospice care. It is focused on providing patients with relief from the symptoms, pain, and stress of a serious illness. The goal is to improve quality of life for both the patient and the family. It is provided by a specialized team of doctors, nurses, and other specialists who work together with a patient's other doctors to provide an extra layer of support. It is appropriate at any age and at any stage in a serious illness and can be provided along with curative treatment. So that's really the main difference, but we're gonna continue. Curative treatment. So palliative is a team of professionals to help the family as well as the patient, but the patient can still have um, aggressive treatment for the condition. Who requires palliative care? Palliative care is appropriate for anyone suffering a serious chronic or life-threatening illness. Example would be cancer, cardiac disease, respiratory disease, kidney failure, Alzheimer's, AIDS, uh, ALS, and more. Palliative care aims to treat the whole person, encompassing not only the physical aspects of an illness, but also the emotional, social, and practical impacts of disease. It can be helpful for patients of all ages. In concurrence with curative treatments for life-limiting problems, living with chronic diseases, nearing end of life. Now hospice, and both of these programs are covered under Medicare, uh, 100%, no deductible, no coinsurance. So if someone's on the palliative services, they eventually may switch over to hospice when they no longer seek aggressive treatment. Some hospice facts, 25% of deaths occur at home more than 80% of Americans would prefer to die at home. There is almost always something that can be done to improve the quality of life for those near death. What can be done may not prolong life, but there is always a, va a valid treatment to bring comfort and dignity. What is hospice? Hospice care is a special kind of care that focuses on the quality of life for people and their caregivers who are experienced and advanced life-limiting illness. It provides compassionate care for people in the last phases of incurable disease so that they may live as fully and comfortably as possible. Hospice care is used when a disease such as advanced cancer gets to the point when treatment can no longer cure or control it. In general, hospice care should be used when a person is expected to live about six months or less if the illness runs its usual course. Studies have shown that hospice care often is not started soon enough. Sometimes the doctor, patient, or family member 
will resist hospice because they think it means giving up or that there's no hope. It's important to know that you can leave hospice and go into active cancer treatment at any time you want. But the hope that hospice brings is a quality life, making the best of each day during the last stages of advanced illnesses. I learned an interesting statistic yesterday where the average stay on hospice is 18 days, even though the benefit is six months or longer. It's actually unlimited. People come on hospice, come off a of hospice. So it truly is a shame that people don't start sooner and have full advantages of all the services that are provided. Some of the myths and facts versus hospice. Enrolling in hospice means giving up. We know that's not true. To get hospice care, I will have to leave my home for an inpatient facility and give up my primary care doctor. That's a myth as well. Hospice care is expensive and family won't be able to afford it. Hospice is just for people with a cancer diagnosis. All hospice providers are pretty much the same. If it is time for hospice, my doctor will talk to me about it. So the facts are enrolling in hospice is choosing to focus on quality of life and focused care. People enrolled in hospice tend to live an average of 29 days longer. Fact, hospice is not a place, it's a service. 67% of hospice patients receive hospice services in their homes. Fact, hospice is covered under Medicare and many private insurance companies. Fact, hospice service serves people at any age dealing with any life-limiting illness and is not limited to those with a cancer diagnosis. Fact, hospice provides an independent and can provide wide range of different services. Fact, many doctors wait for the patient to bring up hospice, leading to late enrollment. Families and patients often wish they had enrolled in hospice earlier. So hospice and palliative care, both provide support to caregivers. They use an interdisciplinary team approach. They focus on pain management, psychosocial and spiritual support and advanced care planning. Can be provided in any setting. Again, it's a service, not a destination. Additionally, hospice is like a traditional visiting nurse but has enhanced services to support patients with less than six months prog prognosis. Hospice strives to keep patients home or in their current setting as they decline. Hospice is for individuals with care goals focused on comfort. In addition, hospice provides bereavement services for 13 months post-death. Advanced care planning. Many patients that I visit have not had an opportunity to um, put their paperwork in order. So advanced care planning is not just about old age. At any age, a medical crisis could leave you too ill to make your own healthcare decisions. Even if you're not sick now, planning for healthcare in the future is an important step to making sure you can get the medical care you want. It prevents over-treatment and under-treatment assures the patient's wishes are known in the event of loss of capacity due to make, to make decisions, prepares the groundwork for future decision making. Advanced care planning involves learning about the types of decisions that might need to be made, considering those decisions ahead of time, and then letting other know, others know both your family and your healthcare providers about your preferences. I can't stress how important it is for people to have their their um, living will, advanced directive, healthcare proxy, financial power of attorney in place sooner than later. Communicating with patients about palliative and hospice care, taking the taking, talking to patients about palliative care can be difficult, especially when patients do not understand what palliative or hospice care entail or know the difference, differences between the two. When starting a conversation, determine the patient has made advanced care plans. If not, elicit and prioritize goals of care. Translate goals into a plan of care. When planning the conversation, make sure to determine what the patient and the family understand about their illness. Realize how well the patient and family are able to understand. Allow enough time for a thorough discussion. 
be aware of, the, of who else will be present at the meeting. Remember, most patients and families want honest, obje objective information. So it's important to have everybody in the family who's willing and able to have a conversation so everybody's on the same page. Communicating with patients about palliative and hospice care. Different cultures and religions deal with death and illness in different ways, so we must honor that. Consider incorporating a chaplain or other religious figures into the, core, the care plan. Be aware that some cultures take a community-based approach to decision-making, family-inclusive decision-making. Avoid using a family member as a translator. They might be unfamiliar with medical terms, may translate incorrectly, or may leave out information to protect the patient. Always offer silent listen, listening and em empathetic responses to emotions. Here's a scenario. Miss Mary is diagnosed with breast cancer and is recommended to start chemotherapy and radiation treatments. Miss Mary knows that chemotherapy can make her feel horrible and radiation can be painful. She is referred to a palliative care program for symptom management and receives excellent treatment for, of chemotherapy induced nausea, fatigue, and oral thrush. She is also visited by a medical social worker who helps her complete her advanced directives, just in case she loses the ability to speak for herself. She gets weekly visits from a chaplain who prays with her and discusses theological questions. Ms. Mary endured three rounds of chemotherapy and a week of radiation, but her breast cancer is aggressive and resistant to treatment. Ms. Mary is told that she has six months to live and is referred to hospice care. Now hospice comes to Miss Mary's home and continues with the expert symptom management. They address new symptoms as they arise and begin to talk to Miss Mary about her impending death and what goals and priority, priorities are. Hospice helps Miss Mary to fulfill her lifelong dream and helps her reconcile with her long estranged daughter. Miss Mary dies peacefully surrounded by her family. Those are the stories that we, we get on a daily basis with hospice and palliative. We, we try very hard to help people with their last wishes, whether they wanna put their toes in the sand at the beach for one more time, our social workers have arranged that in the past and it's a, it's a wonderful story, or whether the patient is in a facility and would like a beer and a pizza once a week. That's what hospice does. So hospice is a team, um, usually with, um, or not usually, with a, a nurse who visits on a regular basis, uh, an aide that visits on a regular basis, any durable medical equipment that is needed, um, a spiritual counselor, as well as a social worker. So all of these people are focused on this one patient. So even if they're in a facility or at home, um, it's always about the patient and the family. So we do have, that support with hospice services. And as it mentioned before, some people do graduate off a of hospice with all the attention. Sometimes um, they become, um, start gaining weight and start um, having more nutrition, which helps them feel better and they start to thrive. So we take them off a of hospice for a while and then eventually put them back on. Does anyone have any questions? But I want to give my name uh, first. My name is Lorraine, spelled L-O-R-R-A-I-N-E, Spiata, S as in Sam, P as in Peter, I-O, double T as in Tom, A as in Apple. I can be reached at 201-906-1274. And I am my community liaison with Hospice of New Jersey. First question. Can you explain the typical transition from palliative care to hospice? In other words, is this an automatic based um, on a medical prognosis or does a doctor or the patient have to make a specific decision? That's a very good question. So um, it does have to meet uh, Medicare guidelines or insurance guidelines regarding end of life. So the symptoms have to be there where a decline is happening. So for example, um, an Alzheimer's patient could be on palliative care for a very long time, but if there's no signs of a decline, uh, they can't possibly uh, be eligible for hospice services just yet. But I, was, I would always inquire on a constant basis because sometimes providers 
um, are waiting for the family to make the suggestion rather than uh, them make the make the suggestion. So I want to clarify then. So are you saying that in certain situations, the family has to come to the doctor to say, hey, I'd like for my family member to go from palliative care to hospice. It's not already decided by the doctor? Correct. Correct. And vice versa. Sometimes the doctor or the hospital is going to be pushing palliative or hospice care, and maybe the family or the person wants to have um, rehab or um, or other medical treatments that they wouldn't qualify for hospice. So, um, but they would qualify for palliative, but it's up to the family. So it's the wishes. That's why it's so important to have people's wishes spelled out correctly to see if they want to have, um, continue to try to uh, have aggressive treatment before they decide. So it is up to the family. Uh, it's important to have an advocate if the person cannot speak for themselves that will stress the fact that the person is not ready for hospice or palliative, even if the facility or the doctors are suggesting it. It just happened to me on a personal level. My father broke his leg, he's Parkinson's, he was in the hospital. They, everybody was, pal um, palliative team was there suggesting hospice and my mother refused to uh, put him on hospice and he's now in a rehab facility and eventually he will go on, ha go on hospice services and uh, he was um, having services from the palliative team because he was still receiving aggressive treatment with physical therapy. So if he had the re aggressive treatment, he wasn't eligible for hospice so we stayed with the the team of uh, palliative care, which consists of just, um, not just, but a palliative team is a nurse, a spiritual counselor, and a social worker, where um, hospice services are the, the nurse, the spiritual counselor, the social worker, uh, also the aid, also all the durable medical equipment. The frequencies of visits are, are more than, than that of a uh, palliative team. So that's the difference. Hospice is a little bit more robust, because the changes are happening more frequently to a person on the uh, when they take a, a turn for the worse, when there's a decline. What's the interaction between the two care teams, the hospice and the palliative care for uh, for an individual? Well, it depends. Um, for example, um, here in New Jersey, we don't have a palliative program. The palliative program is in uh, the hospitals. So we work closely closely with the hospitals. So it's um, it's a team effort. So it's relationships and it's reaching out to um, the different services. So I would never um, say not to keep looking or ask those questions to the palliative team. Who do you use for hospice services? The hospital might have their own hospice company. Here in New Jersey, people have the right to choose a hospice company. So. Um, there's always that option as well. So it is a difficult um, maze of information that caregivers have to um, figure out. Yeah, I was just gonna ask you that question. Can you clarify a little bit? Uh, who chooses um, the care team when it comes to hospice or palliative care? Is Do you have to base these decisions on insurance like Medicare or you know an advocate or a doctor? There's so much information, right, Lorraine? Lorraine how, right. how does one begin to determine who is who when it comes to hospice vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, palliative care? Correct. Um, so palliative, uh, they'll bill Medicare as a specialist, so it's covered under uh, Medicare. Um, hospice services are covered under Medicare Part A, 100%, uh, no deductible, no coinsurance if somebody's over 65 or on Medicare for other reasons. So. Um, Every state is different. So Medicare is Medicare. So that's um, that's Federal. always the same throughout right. the country. But as far as um, providers in different states, it will vary. So here in New Jersey, we have uh, individual hospice companies that people can choose from. And they usually get those referrals from uh, the social worker at the hospital or the facility, the nursing home or assisted living. Uh, we build relationships. So uh, we try to all work together. The more we work together, the easier uh, the transition is, the smoother for the family as far as uh, relationships go. So they're not confused. And that's part of my role as a community liaison is uh, creating relationships between 
um, case managers, social workers, and then I take over and work with the family and explain what hospice is. Right. So you mentioned hospice there. Let's just use New Jersey since that's where you are. So how does somebody know if palliative care is is offered in their state or is it offered in every state? I believe palliative care is offered in every state. Not all hospice companies offer the palliative care. Uh, Some right. might. We have we have programs that um, if people aren't ready yet, it's more of a transitional. So because it's hospice, it's medical. So we can't offer hospice services that like a nurse because we wouldn't have consent signed because the person's not medically eligible under Medicare guidelines, but we could provide other services, um, a social worker call, um, a spiritual counselor, anything the family needs. They don't have to be enrolled in our, in our particular hospice company, but we can provide support um, for the family. I also um, personally have relationships with home care companies. People think hospice provides we do, we're available 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. So if something happens, somebody's at home, two o'clock in the morning, they need assistance and we want to avoid the 911 call going to the hospital. Our nurse at Hospice of New Jersey comes out to the home. So at two o'clock in the morning, a nurse is coming. We have provided already in the home, a comfort kit, oxygen, anything that's needed to keep that person out of the emergency room and comfortable. So the support is there. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Lorraine, you've been in the industry for a long time. I, I'm sure it would be ideal if every potential client or patient was proactive when it comes to their care and their health, but not everybody does that. What would you say to somebody that's watching this as far as um, whether it's their health or a family member's health, what are the first steps they should take when it comes to thinking long-term with regards to palliative care and hospice? Well, again, it would be more finding out what the person's wishes are. So it's important to know whether um, they want to resuscitation or not resuscitated. Do they want to be incubated? Um, do they want to go back and forth to the hospital? There are people out there called, if, if somebody is um, out of state and the mom is here in New Jersey and the children live somewhere else, you can hire care managers. So care managers help the family make decisions as well. Um, they're private pay. Uh, you can hire home health care aides through a home health care company and that support is information as well. So it's just a matter of uh, finding out information and it's not easy. I'm in, I'm in the business and when my dad is in the hospital to find us not to, you know, it's just very stressful. It's um, you hear one thing from one person and you hear another from another person and it's, it's extremely stressful. There's no way that I could see to eliminate the stress of back and forth to the hospital and different doctors and, being discharged to different um, facilities, rehab centers, and then COVID, you know, that changed a lot. There's no visitation in some of the facilities. One, you know, now that we're a year and a half out, you know, some one day there's visiting, next day there's not visiting. So it is, it's not easy, but my, my suggestion would be as a caregiver is to be as organized as possible. So knowing everything about your loved one and keeping a record, whether you have a notebook or my book, Key Solutions for Caregivers, the important thing is to uh, have a resource and a place where everything is in one place. Because the stress of not knowing who the doctor is, what their, num what their phone number is, um, when, when did the person last see them, when was the operation, because the days with the stress just melt into one big <laughs> time. It's just... It's just incredible how the stress really affects not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Yeah. And taking care of the caregiver is the holistic approach for palliative as well as hospice. It's, it's you know, taking care of the whole family. So Lorraine, you had mentioned um, a couple of terms, advocate, uh, care managers. So if somebody, once again, is watching this and they have a loved one, let's just say this loved one is local or from out of state, What's, what does the conversation look like with these professionals to make sure they understand the differences between hospice and palliative? In other words, I assume not every advocate 
is thoroughly aware of hospice or palliative care, so what questions should they be asking before they take this person on in some kind of a role of a, a paid caregiver? Well, the questions, um, it's um, its like a dating game, so you don't have to hire the first um, care manager that you reach out to. It's um, being honest with the care manager and the care manager having um, a good record, you know, good reputation in the community and knows um, different options that are available within the location, knows the buildings or knows the rehab centers or certain doctors. Um, so the questions would be um, for the patient to know um, could, and the care, you know, the care, uh, geriatric care manager to ask what what are the patient's wishes? What is, you know, how long has this been going on? Do they want to stay at home? What are the options available? So it's just a, an open conversation. It's a, it's a personality um, um, relationship because you want somebody uh, who listens very good to you because as a caregiver, um, you're going to be talking about certain things that uh, may not be as important to the case manager or the geriatric care manager, but it's important for you to express your emotions and, and your worries and your concerns. So that person should be a good listener in order to be able to work for you and your family in the best manner possible as opposed to not. Yeah. So you had mentioned Medicare. Um, I want to talk a little bit about paying for this. So can you uh, help us out again as far as what percentage of the costs are covered under Medicare when it comes to palliative care and hospice? Okay. Um, hospice and, and uh, palliative care. Uh, well, hospice is covered under Medicare Part A. So it's covered 100%, no deductible, no coinsurance for an unlimited period of time. So we have people who are on hospice for two years. So unlike the benefit period for rehab or certain other services, hospice is 100% covered, no deductible, no coinsurance, and it could last forever. After, after two benefit periods, uh, we might have to send, we will have to send out a nurse practitioner to make sure the person is still qualified under the Medicare guidelines. But Medicare, just so you know, Medicare is healthcare. So a lot of people are confused between the difference of Medicare and Medicaid. So Medicare is healthcare. So all the healthcare provided under the hospice services, including diapers, are covered under Medicare. So all the durable medical equipment, the nurse, the social worker, um, the spiritual counselor, everything's covered under, except for room and board. So if somebody is in a facility, a nursing home or assisted living, Hospice is a service, not a destination. Medicare is healthcare, so Medicare does not cover room and board. So only Medicaid, Medicaid is uh, when someone spends down all their assets and they qualify for Medicaid, which is a federal program, but state administered. So here in New Jersey, every county has its own Medicaid office. So in order to um, apply for Medicaid, somebody has to have less than $2,000 in assets. If there is a big estate, then an elder law attorney would probably be the best alternative to help the family go through um, Medicaid planning. Um, but if somebody um, doesn't have a lot, they can go directly to the um, county website or their state website. Medicaid benefits differ from state to state. Um, but Medicaid will cover not only all the cost of hospice and palliative, but also the cost of room and board at a facility. But that is a process. It's not, uh, you know, New Jersey's not an easy state to have it. If you're bringing mom up from Florida to another, to New Jersey, it's not reciprocal. It has to be a complete new application. All the documents have to be uh, supplied in a timely manner. Otherwise it goes back to the no good pile um, facilities usually want a Medicaid pending number prior to allowing that person to even come into the building. Usually they request a spend down. Um, so those are the things you have to be aware of, that Medicaid is not a um, automatic benefit. Yeah. Some states are better than others, but. Right. Last question, are pain management medications included in the cost of palliative care and hospice? 
Um, under the hospice benefit, um, the, the pain medicine under the palliative would probably still be under the, the person's um, Medicare supplement through the prescription drug plan. Okay. For hospice, any, sir, any drugs and services related to the condition that we are treating is covered 100% under the hospice benefit. So if, um, which is a good, which brings up a good point. If somebody, let's say, has um, a, a, a condition of, let's say, congestive heart failure, but they're also receiving uh, dialysis for uh, end-stage kidney. If we have the person under congestive heart failure, we cover everything under congestive heart failure. For dialysis, which can continue, where people think hot, once on hospice, all treatments have to be stopped. Only aggressive treatments for the diagnosis that we are supplying services for. So the patient can still continue dialysis because that is keeping that person comfortable for the end stage kidney. We are going to provide oxygen for congestive heart failure, COPD. We're not taking away any medicines. Um, there will be a care plan that will be um, created by, by the RN, the nurse that visits, and the primary care physician remains the primary care physician. And that care plan, whether there's a suggestion to take away a medicine or add a medicine, increase, whatever, is always approved by the primary care physician, the doctor. So everything covered under the diagnosis is covered 100% under the Medicare services under hospice. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Lorraine. Wow. To you. say there's a lot of information here is an understatement. Like you said, it can be a little bit scary. So once again, I imagine the key is to find the right professional or team of professionals. Um, yeah. uh, you had mentioned you'd given out your contact information. What about your website or your book? How can people uh, find that information? Thank you, Jason. <laughs> it is um, my name. So it's www.lorraine, L-O-R-R-A-I-N-E, Spiata, S is in Sam, P is in Peter, I O, double T is in Tom, A is in Apple, dot com. All my con contact information is on that website. Very good. As far as knowledgeable aging, uh, you can go to knowledgeableaging.com, see all of our upcoming and archive webinars. You can also go to YouTube, type in knowledgeable aging. We encourage you to subscribe. We update that as much as possible. If podcasts are your thing, you can go to Apple Tunes, Spotify, et cetera. Till next time, I'm your host, Jason Kotar. This is Knowledgeable Aging.